Hello, Andre Bajowski here, um, uh, together with Reese Taylor. Uh, Reese and I are currently confined to barracks, as millions of others are, as a result of the coronavirus uh, epidemic. So we've decided it might be useful just to have a recording every week or two, uh, just to catch up on a few uh, issues that, are, that have arisen and are arising and are troubling people. And uh, so we've decided to pull up our armchairs around our virtual fireplace and our virtual library, as you can see and uh, have a discussion about something that's uh, close to our hearts. Both Reese and I, as many of you know, are very keen on uh, various kinds of ADR and out-of-court dispute resolution. Uh, so today we thought we'd discuss private FTRs. Uh, hi Reese, how are you? Yeah, morning Andre. Well, thank you at the moment. Jolly good. Nice <laughs> have it stays morning, that way. <laughs> uh, so Reese, any thoughts Do you want to kick off? Yeah, well, um, there's been a, a real increase in private FDRs in the last year or two. What do you think prior to the crisis have been the drivers for that? Well, you're right. I mean, there, there really has. I mean, if, I don't know whether your experience has been the same as mine. I mean, I had months last year where a whole month went past without me going into a formal courtroom at all. All the work's been dealt with by way of private FDRs or arbitrations. Um, and I think that's been largely because of the under-resourcing of the courts over the last a uh, few years, um, even before the pandemic um, struck and created the difficulty we've got now, um, there were difficulties with cases being listed at very long distances uh, from, from the time when, uh, when they were set down. There weren't enough uh, judges to deal with the cases in a timely fashion. Judges' lists were too long, so judges weren't able to give a case the amount of time that it required to properly get in under the skin of the, the case and give a, a proper indication. Uh, the court buildings themselves uh, were not conducive to settlements where people couldn't find a space to speak privately and didn't really have the time to do it. And you just didn't know who you were going to get as a judge. So if you had a particularly complicated case with uh, trusts or companies, pension issues, offshore trust issues, um, you didn't have any guarantee that the judge you got had any particular experience or, or, or expertise in dealing with those sorts of cases. So as a result, people were getting indications at FDRs that they weren't confident in, weren't able to accept. And so they were looking at a better way of doing it. I think that's why the private FDR uh, very much grew, grew up. Um, and that was very much reflected in the settlement rate, which uh, in private FDRs, as you know, quite often, certainly in excess of 90%, close to 100% settlement rate, which speaks volumes for the quality of the process compared to the court alternative. Um, so that's what we're seeing happening last year. I mean, do, do you think that's now going to change as a result of the current circumstances that we're going through? Well, I've um, uh, watched uh, in alarm, as everybody else has, and let's put it in context, there are bigger issues um, in the world at the moment than sorting out divorce settlements, but they are important um, for uh, people who are anxious to have resolution. So I, w I want to get the perspective right in the, in the first instance. Uh, but having uh, set that perspective, I've watched in horror, uh, particularly on Twitter, uh, seeing um, different reports coming in from around the country as to um, how really the court system is melting down. Now, this is not to criticise in any way the efforts of the court staff. This is an absolutely unprecedented um, uh, incident. Um, and uh, what I'm saying now is, is, is not meant critically at all, but um, many uh, companies, many institutions are simply um, melting down under the pressure of things having uh, ground to a halt. Um, we've seen a very impressive document um, from Mr. M Mr. Justice MacDonald about the remote access family court, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Yeah. Um, but uh, and a very interesting uh, comment from uh, somebody who describes himself anonymously as Judge Itis on Twitter yesterday. And he was saying it's all good and well um, having this great protocol in place. But the reality is uh, at the district bench, where a lot of um, our cases get resolved if they're in court, uh, is that they have back to back listing for the rest of the year. Uh, and if one just pictures for a moment the uh, the typical day um, in just about any court, if you're in the FDR list, there'll be perhaps five or six FDRs listed back to back for the day. Um, you might be listed at 10, you might not get, get in maybe until 
12, you'll have your 40 minutes. And then you might check back in with the judge at 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, either with an update or seeking further refinements um, in the indication that's been given. And the, just the raw logistics of trying to um, get that kind of list managed uh, when, as we'll mention in a moment, the court system has profound challenges um, with uh, its IT. Um, and, uh, and, and again, absolutely no disrespect is intended in saying this. You know, people aren't appointed to judicial office because they're IT geeks, but there'll be many judges out there who aren't comfortable or, or just used to working um, uh, paperlessly and working remotely. And so really we, we have this absolute crisis now as to how cases generally are going to be resolved. And um, uh, you and I, obviously, we enjoy our work, but um, it's got to take its place in the queue and it's going, going realistically going to take its place in the queue behind public law children, um, issues about um, uh, people losing their homes and things like that. Uh, so whilst our work is very important and profoundly important for the people who are uh, engaged in it all, um, uh, I foresee over the coming months us um, not really being at the front of the queue for judicial time and, and looking at things macroeconomically. That's right. But we still have clients who will want to resolve their cases. Um, and I think um, this is a moment um, where um, private FDRs have the potential to um, really uh, take off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now we'll we'll talk about the um, the guidance from Mr. Justice Mostyn uh, about them and some other judicial guidance in a moment. But I'm uh, interested, Andre, and um, you're uh, something of a guru um, with uh, private FDRs. Uh, I'm not so lucky as you to have spent um, several um, uh, months last year not seeing the inside of a court. Um, but c could you just give us a bit of a feel? about um, what an FDR is and how it differs from a court FDR? Well, fundamentally, it's the same thing. Um, it's, uh, as you know, it's a species of early neutral evaluation, or maybe even not that early. It can come quite late in the process, but it's about appointing uh, an independent, impartial person who in the court system is obviously a judge, but in the private FDR system is somebody who the parties have chosen to give the parties a view as to what would be an appropriate outcome in their case. Um, so from that extent, it's very different to mediation where the mediator specifically doesn't get involved with giving a view as to the merits. The evaluator's job is just that. It's to, uh, to give the parties a benchmark that they can use either as the settlement itself or the basis from which they, they negotiate their settlement. Um, so from that point of view, it's exactly the same as what the court is doing. Um, the differences are really that it can address a lot of those shortcomings that that I identified when, when you asked me earlier on about why there were so many private FTRs becoming uh, popular last year. Um, because it's not at the court, uh, you can avoid all the difficulties there are with the comfort and privacy. You can hold it in usually barristers' chambers or in a solicitor's office. Everybody is definitely going to have a room. Coffee is going to be available, biscuits, anything else that's required. And there's so much, there's so much the more control. Yeah. Well, maybe not at the moment, but this is, you know, I'm talking about the way, it's, the way it's operated before. And I think we'll talk in a moment about how how it's going to look if you're doing it in a remote, in a remote way. Um, perhaps the biggest selling point for it is that uh, you've got a judge or an evaluator that the parties have selected. So you know it's somebody who has definitely got the skills and the attributes to deal with the issues in the case, but also to deal with uh, the emotional and softer aspects of the case and understanding how parties um, negotiate settlements and what they need. So you're guaranteed to have a specialist and you're also guaranteed that that specialist is going to have the time to deal with your case because you're not going to be in a queue with five or six or seven other cases in the day. Um, the evaluator will read all of the papers. They will be on top of it. They're going to be probing the issues. And uh, you probably have, like I've had the experience where you go before um, uh, a private FTR judge and the judge so in some respect, knows the papers better than you do. And that's always a bit frightening as an advocate. But it, it shows that they, you've got somebody who's really properly got to grips with the case um, and is therefore going to give a indication which the parties are going to be able to respect. 
And if they can respect it and see that it's been reached in a really clear, uh, careful, and properly thought through fashion, they're far more likely to give it weight than coming out of a court where both advocates turn to their parties and say, well, the judge didn't really get that. And therefore, uh, the indication that's been given isn't, isn't so powerful. And then in addition to all of that, you, you're probably going to have additional services that the, the evaluator provides that a judge in court just doesn't. Um, you may well get a Duxbury calculation printed out bespoke for your case to back up the figures the evaluator is giving. You may well have a spreadsheet the evaluator has done that sets out exactly the workings that, the, that they've reached in order to reach the conclusion. All of it just makes a process that the parties have got a lot more confidence in. Can I just pick up on one thing that you were saying there um, about having an impartial tribunal? Mm-hmm. Um, the, um, the family bar, in many respects, is a small world, um, and there may be some nervousness, uh, perhaps, uh, about um, it being too chummy. And, um, uh, and I wonder whether you'd be able to um, just describe a little bit about the partiality or impartiality and how that works and what the law is in respect of that. Yeah, well, I mean, we're not going to get too bogged down with the law in relation to it, but in relation to um, impartiality, you can very, be very confident that any person who's offering a service in this way wants to do more of them. They're not just out to do one FDR. And if anyone gets a reputation as not being impartial or being in any way biased towards members of their own chambers or in some way uh, more favourable to people they know than to people they don't, um, I think in the first place that's not going to happen. But it's also not going to happen because people like that aren't going to be getting work for very long. So everybody who's got a reputation for doing this type of work, like barristers uh, generally, is going to have the self-respect and the professionalism to make sure they do it independently. In terms of the legal aspects, there's certainly no bar to members of the same chambers acting as a private FDR judge in a case in which another member of chambers is instructed in the same way as there's no bar to them acting uh, against each other in cases where they're on opposite sides. And you expect them to fight them as hard. And as you and I know, as yes. colleagues, quite often the hardest fight you'll ever get is when you're against another member of your own chambers. As we've done against each other recently. <laughs> yeah, very little quarter was given, Mr. Taylor. Uh, so, so we all know that that's how the process works. But of course, if people are uncomfortable with the perception of it, because often the perception is more important than anything else, by all means, choose, a, choose an arbitrator or a, an FDR judge who is not in the same chambers as either of the advocates. And that's not difficult because there's plenty of people out there in the market who can do that. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a concern that people should have. Um, and frankly, you know, I've not in any way ever, ever experienced any sense that there's been that uh, degree of favouritism or bias towards a particular person at all. No. OK, well, that's very helpful. Thank you. I mean, so, Rhys, I mean, you, you, particularly because you do a fair bit of work in London and also you know, out on circuit, as, as do I. Do, do, I mean, what's your general sort of um, impression of how the judges have, have approached private FDRs. Are they receptive to the idea or have you found um, a degree of resistance? Uh, it's variable um, to, to date. Um, uh, I'm, I'm aware on in some um, court centres outside of London um, that there's a reluctance to embrace them or at least there was hitherto um, the crisis. Um, uh, quite quite how, how people will be approaching it now is another matter. Mm. Um, but of course there, there are other there are other centres <clears throat> that are um, very very receptive <clears throat> and also quite um, sanguine in the way in which they approach it. So I made some submissions um, the other day uh, in a case saying, well, um, w- we might want uh, a private uh, FDR uh, judge in this case or provision within the first appointment directions for this. And a very experienced um, district judge said, I-, I understand what you're saying here, Mr. Taylor, you're worried about this going in front of a deputy who doesn't know anything about family law. Um, I understand your concerns. I just want to reassure you um, that if this comes back um, uh, to to court for a court-based FDR, I can see it's complicated and I will deal with it. Um, But I have no objections at all if in fact you want to go down the private FDR route. So it it was a very, very relaxed approach um, and, and a very helpful and constructive approach. Yeah, yeah. But of course, we're not, we're not in normal times anymore. So I no, think, not, yeah, I think no, we're now was, going to see a, see a, see a, see a different approach, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Another age ago. Yeah. But of course, I mean, from, from the top, we've had a fair bit of guidance suggesting already that uh, this is a route that people should look at taking. And that, that's only just been strengthened, I think, more recently, hasn't it? Yes, we have. So 
Um, if you uh, um, have a bit of time on your hands over um, the next couple of months, you might like to dig through all of Mr. Um, or not Mr. Justice, um, Sir James Mumby's views from the President's Chambers. Um, because he had a lot to say about family law. But his last one, as he went out of the door, um, almost as an afterthought, um, uh, was um, about uh, private FDRs. And it was clear he was very anxious um, before he let go of the reins finally to, to make sure that he conveyed to the profession um, how important he thought this was. And um, so in his view on the 27th of July, um, of um, uh, last year, we had um, a, a number of uh, paragraphs which are very supportive of private FDRs running alongside um, the creation of the Financial Remedies Court pilot system. So from the top, um, we have that support. And then um, uh, there was a, a book published by um, Class um, Publishing, the people who do At A Glance um, uh, last year. Um, no, no, the year before actually, um, with um, uh, Miss Justice Bennett, Duncan Brooks, and Miss Justice Mostyn as a consulting editor. And um, uh, he, the foreword is written by Sir Andrew McFarlane. And he says, I stand as one with my predecessor, Sir James Mumby, in hoping that all family judges will take the opportunity to develop and encourage the use of private FDRs. So although not in a formal view, um, he stands four square with that original view. I think I said a moment ago it was last year. I was wrong in saying that. It was, the, it was actually um, July 18. I think mm. life has moved on. No, no, you did say it was the year before. You did say it was the year before, yeah. Yeah, you did say. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then uh, last year, we had the Financial Remedies Court Good Practice Protocol. And at paragraph 10, it says this. I'm going to read it out, if I may. Uh, where a case has been re um, <coughs> referred to to be dealt with by an out-of-court settlement mechanism, it shall not ordinarily be given for the court time save for a short directions appointment, which may be vacated by consent in the event an agreement is reached and a consent order presented and approved. Where a private FDR has taken place, the next financial remedies court judge dealing with the case will ordinarily wish to be satisfied that a thorough FDR exercise has taken place and the party should provide a written explanation to that judge of what has happened and so the FRC judge can be so satisfied. And this, the next bit is important. Absent specific inquiry uh, by the Financial Remedies Court judge, this explanation should not include reference to any without prejudice positions, but should describe the date of the private FDR, the tribunal, the time spent, and an assurance that offers were made and e on each side and an indication given. So um, a, a number of important points come out of that passage. First of all, um, it's a, a clear indication in official guidance that if you have a private FDR, um, then you, you're not going to have a judge saying, uh, well, I, uh, in the ordinary course at least, uh, I'm insisting on a court FDR anyway. You're not duplicating your efforts. Uh, and secondly, <clears throat> that passage is dealing with the um, important relationship um, between uh, a, a privileged event, a, uh, an FDR, which as we all know from court-based pr practice is uh, without prejudice, uh, and then what the subsequent court is able to inquire about. Uh, and uh, I understand that both uh, the FLBA and Resolution were consulted about that paragraph and were content that the, the barest of indications um, about um, the nature of the tribunal, the time spent and the short offers were given, but without detailing them, um, was considered to be um, uh, satisfactory in the circumstances. Now, it does have the proviso, absent of specific inquiry, um, that um, uh, no further information should be given. I am aware of some judges who have said they have made um, further inquiry, wanting to be absolutely certain that this is a case where no stone was left unturned 
in uh, seeking a resolution before um, court resources are used in listing for final hearing. Uh, and um, the, the way in which uh, I'm aware judges have approached it is to say that if they are making specific inquiry, um, they are in effect uh, under the rules um, listing a, in the directions appointment a mini FDR. And if they are if they are told any um, privileged information um, uh, with or without prejudice uh, information, um, then they can no longer have any further substantive involvement in the case. Mm. Um, so far as I understand it, it has been in a tiny minority of cases that that has happened. But well, I have to say, I mean, I mean, despite what the, that guidance says, it, I, I've never had a judge who's been faced with a case that's come back to the court after a failed private FTR. And as I say, there are relatively few that go to a private FTR that do fail, because most yeah. of them do actually settle. Yeah. Um, but those that have, certainly in the early days, maybe three or four years ago, there were a few judges saying, well, no, we're going to still do it properly in the court process. Uh, but certainly in, in the CFC and the courts that I tend to go to, judges have accepted the parties have had a go at it. And um, as long as they, as you said, they usually like to know who the, uh, the, the, the private FTR judge was. But if it's a, a known uh, London uh, specialist barrister, generally that's regarded as being uh, you know, a tribunal that's robust and sensible. Um, and the, the court leaves it at that. So right, that's the FDR done. If you've not managed to settle the, the, there, mm -hmm. then we're just going to carry on. Uh, with directions towards the final hearing without insisting on a second FDR, yeah. unless the parties say, no, actually, we want one. Yeah, so I agree with all of that, o o Andre, but the uh, I think the issue which is being teased out in the protocol is the fact that the court does have a duty under the rules to list an FDR, mm. um, and as I say, in a tiny minority of cases that I am aware of, um, where further specific inquiry has been made, that is the way the, the, the way in which the judges have reconciled the relationship between a private FDR and, and the court. Mm. Um, the, 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 I, think, I, th I think in the moment, Rita, I mean, this is, this is largely academic, isn't it now? Because yes, uh, yes, you know, is, yes. uh, in, in the current circumstances, last, last week, uh, Mr. Justin Mostyn issued the shortest and most pithy of all the guidance notes that we've had in recent times, because most of them, as you know, run to many, many pages and we're getting guidance, yes. guidance weary now. Uh, but here's with only six paragraphs or so. And he very clearly in that said the parties should be encouraged to have their FDRs done privately uh, and they should Absolutely. be done remotely. And so Absolutely. I think at the moment, if there's been a private FDR and if the parties have asked for a private FDR, the courts are simply going to say, yep, get on with it. And I can't see them insisting on a, uh, a court FDR uh, no, as well. I, I totally agree with you. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm just setting out um, how, how we got to... Uh, to where we got to last week yeah. with um, yeah. Mr Justice Mostyn's guidance, yeah. but you're absolutely yeah, right. I think, I think the, issue, the issue now really is for those few cases that are still going to run through the courts, because if the parties can't agree to go to private FDR or can't afford to, which you know is one of the issues we're going to come to, the court process is still going to uh, be the default. Um, and I know anecdotally there's a number of courts that are currently still listing uh, FDRs and are going to give them a time marking because that's the only way that they can deal with a remote link up, that it needs to be between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock, for example, uh, rather than being block listed at 10 o'clock, which is uh, as they've always been done. Um, but I must say, I'm not sure how well the courts are going to, to be able to manage that. Um, no. Well, they're You mentioned some of the issues. That, well, they are overwhelmed, and they're, they're very much playing catch-up in relation to the IT they've got. I mean, we had a, a commendably complete and, and, and thorough document uh, authored by Mr. Mr. Justin MacDonald uh, which was issued, I think, only on Monday this week. Uh, we're broadcasting on uh, or recording this on Thursday. Yesterday, we had version two of that. Um, and interestingly, version two contains a lot of commentary on some of the issues that the courts are having. So I, can, I think I can bring this up on screen um, and, and show you some of the, the, the passages within, within the document. So if I just bring that up onto, onto screen so people can see it. Um, so, so this is, as you see, this is the version two document and the, the changes to it have been highlighted in red. So one of the, the bits can that... Just, that can I just chip in and say, Andre, that uh, you talked about guidance fatigue. Um, if somebody um, has not been tracking all the guidance that's been coming out in the last week, this is the most helpful document. This document and Mr Justice Mostyn's um, uh, uh, document, I think, are the for money practitioners are most definitely the most helpful. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I mean, each, each division of the, 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 the high court has now issued its own guidance, basically, hasn't it? So 
uh, if you practice in other areas, you would obviously need to, to look at the guidance for the Queen's Bench Division, for example. But this is, I, I agree, that now the definitive guidance to be used in the family court, with the addition of uh, Mr Justice Mostyn's short practice note, which applies to the Financial Remedies Court. Uh, but you can see from the note here that there was a section that dealt with uh, judicial access to a range of communications platforms because the court was uh, scrambling around to try and find what uh, what options are available. And you can see, uh, even since the note was done on Monday, clearly the feedback has come back to uh, Mr Justice MacDonald about some of those issues, and he's uh, fed into the document issues they've identified. For example, I've highlighted the fact that um, not all of the machines that the court service are using are open in, in the sense of having a operating system and connected up to a network which allows them to access anything as you and I do from our, uh, our work machines at home. Um, as a result of which, although they can use Skype for business, um, they're not able to use other platforms such as Zoom, uh, which is what we're using for recording this, uh, this, uh, this uh, meeting on. Um, Skype for Business has created a problem where uh, if they're using dual screens in court, it seems that's having some effect over the audibility and the audio working. Judges who are using um, Skype for Business or indeed any other platform, if they've only got access to one screen, are not able to access the e-bundle at the same time as using the video conference, uh, which is obviously a challenge because it seems that many judges are not set up for home working um, in the way that um, many of us have, have perhaps been doing for years already. Uh, or certainly on set up for multiple screen use if they've be, always been used to using paper. Um, and um, there's also just a general issue for part-time judges accessing the right equipment because they haven't got court, is court service issued laptops and computers. Yeah. Um, and they've also raised the issue at the bottom here, which I'm sure many, many other people are experiencing as well, that if you live on a fast broadband connection, fine. You, you should be able to deal with all these services quite well because Zoom doesn't use a great deal of bandwidth. Um, mm -hmm. But if you live out in the sticks a long, long way from the exchange, you may be on a very slow exchange, uh, which will make uh, video conferencing very difficult, if not impossible, to, to use. And then finally, there's the, the point about the fact that many judges are simply not IT literate and are going to be struggling to catch up with all of this. So, yeah. so although I agree with you in your sentiments at the beginning that the courts are, are clearly motivated to do the best that they can and to continue to uh, service the needs of litigants um, going through the court, they are going to be very stretched. And I agree with you that, that things like private FDRs are likely to be the alternative to the court FDR just because the courts are probably going to struggle to, to accommodate them. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, the, the, the IT capacity um, is a profound issue. And, um, you know, we've been seeing lots of courts uh, being closed in the name of a brave digital future, which... Um, is not yet upon us, so the timing um, is un is unfortunate. But you and I are um, in different locations, having this conversation now um, with uh, very easy to set up uh, in Zoom, and of course um, in in Zoom you can also create your breakout rooms so that people can have private rooms to speak in. So we'll come to that uh, in a moment. <clears throat> Zoom, I'm sorry, Skype for Business, the courts. Um, main facility has limitations and there's a further problem many uh, practitioners are um are on office 365 and a skype for business is a a product which is going to be closed um in a short period of time and what microsoft have been doing for um a, a long period of time is trying to get people away from using skype for business by nudging them onto their new product, which is called Teams. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ways in which they've been nudging people onto Teams is degrading the capacity of Skype for Business. Um, and therefore, uh, if, you've, if you've got um, uh, Office 365, uh, there's all kinds of um, anecdotal accounts of people really struggling to be able to access um, uh, a, a functional a version of Skype for Business where you can invite people. A really handy tip, um, which I've seen in some guidance, um, which has been put around by the FLBA, is that there is a link, um, uh, which I, I, I tweeted um, uh, yesterday, I think, 
uh, which allows people who have struggled to download um, a completely functional version of Skype for Business. Um, you can have a web um, um, scheduler. <clears throat> so if you go to this link, even if you haven't got a fully functional Skype for Business, you can still invite people to a meeting. So that's a really handy little tip, but it just sort of underlines um, the difficulties that we're having with um, accessing the court, that you've got to sort of know these sort of um, uh, tricks and traps in order to be able to even get through to the court in the first yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're going to be at 36 using um, uh, Zoom because every member of Chambers has got a Zoom license that Chambers has provided to them many, many years ago now. We've, we've had this for a couple of years now and used it for video conferencing uh, for quite a while. So now it's finding finding its, its legs and, and so it's very very easy for um, anyone to use because if we set it up and it'll be whoever's hosting it as the, the, the early neutral evaluation judge the private FDR judge to, to set it up uh, we'll simply send a link out to uh, the participants in it all they will need to do is click that link they don't need to download any of the zoom software they don't need to have a zoom account to do it um, the person who's controlling the meeting um, but we, we have a screen where we can, as you say, uh, share documents, and we've already uh, demonstrated how we've been doing that, which is very useful. Anyone who's using it can can use that function, which means if you're the advocate and you have a document which the judge doesn't have, such as a photograph of something, and you want the judge to see that, that can be demonstrated and shown to everybody at the same time by the share screen function. You can do the same with schedules or other documents that you've got uh, open and you, you want everybody to look at at the same time. Uh, which may well come into its own, even if we're doing trials through this this medium in due course. Um, so th this is certainly software that we think works really well, and uh, it's probably superior to any of the, the things that are being offered by the courts at the moment. Yeah, certainly. Um, just moving on, if I may, um, you mentioned about being able to choose um, a, a, a evaluator or a private FDR judge um, who um, the, the parties are agreed upon, and do you have any observations about the kind of characteristics um, that uh, a good private FDR judge has? Well, um, well clearly the, the ones that you and I have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, ultimately, I think it flows from what the purpose of the, the, the private FDR is. It's to give an indication to the parties, which the parties have the confidence to feel is a fair outcome, which they can work with and settle somewhere either or dead on what the indication is in the ideal case or within the parameters that that indication is given. So I think clearly the most important characteristic is there's got to be somebody who is clearly competent and is sufficiently experienced and knowledgeable in the area of law to give the party the confidence that what that person is saying is a, is a good indication of what's likely to happen if their case goes all the way to a final hearing and is decided by a judge in court. I mean, beyond that, it's, to an extent, there's a little bit of horses for courses, isn't there? Because each case is different and the, the attributes or the skills of the particular um, private FDR judge that you want are going to vary from case to case. If it's a very technical case involving uh, specific issues like pensions or trusts or companies, and clearly you're going to look for somebody who's got the expertise and the experience in those areas. Um, if it's an issue which is purely binary in terms of mm. there's a point of law on which the case will turn, which is actually quite rare, isn't it, in financial remedies cases. But let's say it is that sort of case. In those sorts of cases, you really want somebody who's just a legal expert, can give a view in the bedside manner that that person has. It's probably less important because it is just a judgment on whether one party is right or the other party is right as on a matter of law. But those, those aren't normal financial remedies cases. Most financial remedies cases are far more evaluative. There's far more discretion that dictates what the outcome is going to be. So you, you also need somebody who's got those softer skills, a little bit closer to maybe the mediation skills, to be able to understand how a settlement process comes about and to help the parties, on a, even on a psychological level, come to the position where they can settle the case. And so to that extent, it's about finding somebody who is able to listen carefully to the case, make sure both parties feel they've properly had their cases listened to, is able to explore the issues in the case in a challenging way polite courteous yes it's no, there's no room for bullies and uh, and, and browbeating in, in this business but but is able to challenge and probe the propositions that are being put by either party and so at the end of that whole process even if somebody has put the case to the evaluator and the evaluator doesn't agree with them they know that they've gone out and had that evaluation done 
on the basis of a full hearing, a proper hearing, and a proper consideration of all the issues. So I think that's what it really boils down to. It's, it's, yeah. it's that sort of package of skills. Yeah. I think also there's the um, there's more space in the private FDR um, for um, further um, indications to be given. So uh, one appreciates the pressure, even in normal times, that a court is under. Um, but sometimes uh, um, a, a judge may give an indication um, that isn't perhaps um, w what one side would have wanted to have heard. Uh, and they want to say, well, that's based on a particular view. But if, if this particular fact changed or you took a different view about this fact, would your, um, would your indication change? Mm. Uh, and, and asking for sort of um, different, um, uh, different types of indication depending on, uh, depending on A or depending on B or C. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, my experience in court is that uh, sometimes a court finds a request for, for them to sort of um, go back over their indication as some indication of impertinence where in fact it's not impertinence, you're um, trying to explore all angles in the case and to make sure um, that the client who is sat um, behind you is seeing that absolutely every base is covered. And yeah, I think yeah. in the private FDR context, um, there's the space to do that more easily. Yeah. Well, I, I agree, and I think that comes, to the, but there, there are two um, slightly contrasting attributes that the, the private FDR judge has got to have as a, to, to, to accommodate that. Yes, they've got to have the flexibility of mind and the humility to perhaps accept that an indication that they've given earlier isn't written in stone and needs to be re-evaluated. But by the same measure, because we all know the games that go on um, within negotiations and private FDRs, they've got to be sufficiently robust to stand up to somebody who's just trying to, to push them and bully them into changing their, their, no, their indication. And, and so you need to have that as well, because you know, there's nothing less helpful than an FDR judge who's given a clear indication and then for no apparent reason then seems to back, backtrack on it, because that's taking away all the ground that's been built, been built up. Yes. But of course, I mean, all of this, unfortunately, comes at a cost, doesn't it? I mean, there is, there is an issue that has to be addressed and we can't, we can't get away from it. Parties are going to have to pay for somebody to do the, the job that they don't have to pay the, uh, the judge to do in the normal course of things. I mean, what, broadly speaking, I mean, what, what sort of sense do you get as to what this costs? <clears throat> well, um, of course, barristers aren't supposed to, are we? Because um, we give no thought whatsoever um, to uh, to that because this is merely a calling and that um, we should direct all um, inquiries about such a grubby thing as money um, to Danny or to one of our other clerks but as you ask and as we're in exceptional times um, I, I, I think it probably is helpful to mention I think it would be fair to say that a conventional bracket um, for a senior junior um, it would be between, for, for a one day, private FDR of some complexity, somewhere between three and four thousand pounds. And, um, you know, there may be some um, uh, very successful and busy juniors who are a little bit more than that. And there may be some um, who are willing to trim their fees um, in, in the circumstances. But I would say that is the bracket that most senior juniors um, would, be, uh, would be operating in for a, a full day um, Rolls-Royce private FDR. That of course would be um, uh, sort of 1,500 to 2,000 pounds per party. Uh, and seen in that context is perhaps um, a very small slice of their overall legal spend. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think as a general sort of rule of thumb, I've, I've always thought that most private FDR judges who are barristers tend to charge a similar fee for doing the private FDR as a evaluator as they might charge for doing the private FDR as an advocate so yeah. the, the fees that they charge as an advocate is often a good indicator of what their fees are as a private yes, FDR judge. I that's very helpful yes um, but in um, these uh, difficult times um, there may be other um, models out there which haven't yet really taken on hmm. I know that you and I have discussed um, and are willing to offer um, uh, and I, I don't use this word um, pejoratively, um, quick fire um, private FDRs. So rather than um, paying for an, an arbit, uh, a private FDR evaluator for the day, you could um, book one for say two hours. And I think um, that the bracket there um, would be uh, significantly lower and, and, and the, the parish, if I can put it that way, would be more in the region uh, perhaps of a thousand pounds. 
Yeah. Um, and that would um, bring um, the benefits of a private FDR, um, uh, uh, albeit on a time limited basis, uh, to be more available to people who perhaps wouldn't be able to pay the, the higher fee for a full day. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just looking on my screen here. We've, we've now got a set, set of rates for 36 family uh, members who are, who are doing private FDRs. And uh, they, they're quite a range of people in terms of expertise and, uh, and experience and call. Um, but they, they, the rates for what you describe as the quick fire, which I think we're offering a two hour um, uh, fixed appointment effectively, uh, clearly, there's some flexibility around that, but it, you know, if, if people have got other commitments in the day, it's the two hour slot that, that is when the video link will be available. There's always the option to come back in a little bit later on, but that'll be subject to other commitments that we have. Uh, and the rates for that vary for um, between about um, 500 uh, at the lower end for more junior practitioners up to 1,000 at the upper end. So um, you're talking about potentially getting a private FDR judge uh, at at a junior level for a relatively straightforward case with each party paying only 250 pounds each, uh, which is not, not a million miles from uh, the cost that they'd be incurring going to court in any event. No. Um, when we um, <coughs> in other forms of um, ADR, I'm thinking particularly um, mediation and a long-standing practice of signing an agreement and then also arbitration, where, where, of course, it is absolutely a prerequisite to have a contract in place um, to actually constitute an arbitral tribunal. And um, I wonder whether you'd be able to um, give your observations about how um, ag agreements um, do or don't happen in the context of uh, the private FDR. I mean, in my experience, they, they very rarely happen. Um, I, I don't think I've ever done one as an advocate where the private FDR judge has requested a written agreement in advance. Um, I think it would be helpful in many cases if people did, because one of the problems that, that, that can arise in a, in a private FDR, of course, is that the judge doesn't actually have any coercive powers. He's not a judge. He is just a, another barrister in the party all there voluntarily. So <clears throat> unless you set out some sort of ground rules around what the process actually is, there is, the, there is always a danger that somebody just walks away from it um, uh, or, or deals with it in, a, in an inappropriate fashion. So having some sort of written agreement at least ties people in and gives everybody a set of rules by which they can operate. Um, and certainly in terms of without prejudice, confidentiality issues, who attends, um, issues such as that, having an agreement in place, I think, would be a good discipline to have. Um, so... So, yeah, I mean, I, I personally think that they, that we, they should. And you, 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 I know you share that view because you and I yeah. both have worked on a draft that, uh, yeah. uh, that, that we do offer to people. Well, uh, as I'm um, a mediator as well, I'm just astonished um, when this market started to develop and um, that people were just hosting these meetings um, on the assumption um, that the without prejudice um, uh, privilege and confidentiality will apply. Now, it may well be um, that they can be implied as a matter of law, um, but um, such is the importance of those expressed terms being agreed in a mediation. It, it strikes me um, that perhaps um, some very excellent um, private uh, FDR uh, uh, judges who don't um, uh, perhaps aren't mediators have, have perhaps missed a trick in not in, in insisting that those documents, um, I'm sorry, those clauses are actually um, set up because they're, um, they, they really are quite important to make sure um, that those things are hammered down. And that's particularly so in the, um, in the remote context. Ah, you found it. Well done. So here's our um, private um, FDR agreement. We've called it an early neutral evaluation agreement. Uh, a private FDR is essentially um, an early neutral evaluation. And um, those... I think the reason we've used that terminology is because we use these in Talata disputes and uh, disputes that are outside the financial remedies context as well, don't we? Yes, yes. And the, um, the, the document um, uh, has uh, many similarities with a, a mediation agreement um, and just has clauses which um, you'd be um, uh, practitioners would be very 
uh, familiar with. Um, one of the issues, of course, um, if, you're, if you're doing a private FDR um, properly is that they are confidential and there is provision within this agreement for um, uh, confidentiality and for information uh, contained within um, the, the FDR not to be shared outside of the meeting and anyone who's present at the meeting, um, even if they're um, present remotely in, in the room with a husband or a wife, would have to uh, would have to sign uh, this this document was uh, drafted prior to the crisis and I've seen some guidance um, which is uh, out there um, in uh, I think in M Mr Justice McDonald's and and perhaps in uh, other guidance as well that there should be an indication given at the start of the meeting or the hearing as to who is actually present and it and it would make sense for that kind of clause to be replicated in this document, although um, it isn't in the one that we're showing presently here. So I think if you're um, uh, wanting uh, to engage a, um, a private FDR tribunal, a document such as this, and there's no magic in this one, there's any, uh, many different ways in which um, that they, can, they can be put together, something like this, making express those things we take for granted, I think is important and it also keeps keeps some control or more control uh, in the situation given um the uh the remote nature of the yep. hearing i mean i mean i've given some thoughts and, and it may be in some cases appropriate to, to do it is to you could include terms such as the parties agree that no one will leave the uh the private fdr uh until uh the private fdr uh, judge the, the evaluator indicates that the process is closed, which, you know, potentially creates a little bit more like the, the court-based um, scenario where the parties can't just walk out before the process is finished. Of course, it's not, it's not going to be binding on the day, but if it's written down and parties assigned to it, it just provides a little bit of extra leverage. And there is also potentially scope for the parties to agree uh, that they, they, they agree that if the private FDR doesn't succeed in a settlement, uh, there might be consideration given to the private FDR judge at the end of the day indicating appropriate directions if for example if the parties want that uh, those are probably optional clauses that can be built in uh, or added to an agreement with following discussion with the parties if they want to do that but those are refinements um, that you can build into it there's no there's no single template is there for private FDRs it's a it's a flexible process which can be adapted to be used in the right way for the, for the particular needs of any particular case okay so I think we're um, we're getting to the end of what we really want to say now but can I mm. just ask um, how for someone who's not done a private FDR um, before um, and let, let's talk about it um, not remotely to start with what, what would you expect how, how, do, how do they work well the day the day runs pretty much as it would do at court except that it's not at court so it'll be hosted in um, the chambers of the the, the the barrister who's hosting it or at some other venue that's have been agreed in 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 all probability there are going to be four rooms um, there'll be a room for uh, the hearing to take place in, a room for each of the parties to use as their conference room, private from each other, and in an ideal world there'll be a fourth breakout space, a fourth room, where the advocates can go and speak in order to negotiate privately away from everybody else. If there are only three rooms then another space might need to be found to, uh, to use, use that. And then the day proceeds pretty much as it would do at court. The parties will probably have some pre-hearing discussions and negotiations. Uh, the uh, if they don't manage to make any progress from those, they're likely to start the hearing. If they're making progress, the private FDR judge is likely to allow them time to uh, to discuss further to see if they can reach a solution. But always keeping an eye on the clock, because if you don't get an indication until mid-afternoon, then obviously it's rather late then to negotiate after that. So trying to get an indication in the morning is useful. But then if they haven't, following that hearing, uh, managed to, to uh, sorry, following the discussion, haven't managed to reach an agreement, they'll have a hearing. Both sides will present their case. It's likely to be a good deal more thorough than the hearing you would have in court if you're doing the Rolls-Royce full day service because there'll be more time to deal with it. There'll be more submissions. There'll certainly be a lot more questions, I would imagine, from the tribunal to each of the advocates. The parties in a, a particular case might possibly be engaged as well by the, uh, the FDR judge directly, if that's helpful. Um, and the private FDR judge in everything other than a very 
straightforward case is likely then to want to take a bit of time to collect their thoughts after the hearing and will then give a reasoned indication. So rather than just putting a finger in the wind and telling you the way it feels, they're likely to do some proper calculations, maybe even give you some documents that set out in written terms what their indications are on the main points with the calculations of support, maybe with a Duxbury calculation if you're talking about a case where there's going to be capitalization of maintenance. The party will then withdraw, they'll carry on negotiating, and as you said earlier on, they can come back in and out as many times as they need to on further points as they arise throughout the day. So very similar to the court, but obviously with the, the advantage that you've got your, your arbitrator, your, your uh, private FTR judge locked into just your case for that period of time. I think one of the things I've really um, appreciated about private FDRs as well is that you're not being tipped out into the street at five o'clock. And yeah. one knows that just in the ordinary dance of a, ne a negotiation, it's quite often the case that um, the, the serious negotiating <clears throat> isn't happening until 3.30 in the afternoon. And then um, uh, you've, if you can get to heads of agreement, um, quite often at that point parties say, well, we'd like to we'd like to hammer this out into an agreement if it's at all possible. Mm. And I found it singularly unhelpful um, to get to five o'clock and to be um, tipped out into the street by the court staff and then to have to decamp either to a solicitor's office if there is one nearby or even on occasions <clears throat> into a restaurant or something like that. Well, yeah, and Bognor Regis, uh, Bognor Regis Weatherspoons always <laughs> sticks in my mind. <laughs> Um, but I mean, how, but how do we recreate that? I mean, I'm not, I'm not to, don't mean the Bognor Regis weather speed, but how do we recreate the, the, the process remotely? Well, um, as you've indicated, um, 36 um, primarily will be using Zoom. Um, this um, uh, presentation that we're doing hopefully gives some indication of the, the, the quality of the, um, the transmission and the way in which uh, it's easy to communicate with one another. Um, what would happen is that in advance of the meeting, uh, a, uh, the parties and the advocates would be sent a link um, so that they can join a meeting which is hosted by the private um, evaluator. Um, the evaluator can then um, give the, the parties space within um, the overall meeting to go into private rooms to have discussion uh, and you can have um, private rooms for the parties to um, discuss things confidentially with their lawyers and you can also um, have a, um, uh, a digital corridor as it were or breakout room where the barristers uh, or advocates or solicitors or whoever they are who are actually representing the parties can go and have further negotiations, not in front of the parties, um, which um, one appreciates um, is the usual way of things in court. Um, now, I know, Andre, you have um, some views about that. Um, uh, uh, we've um, used the breakout rooms in Zoom and uh, they do work. And um, the, the, the person who uh, is hosting it can't um, be a, a nosy neighbour and, and put their digital glass against the um, wall and listen to what's going on. Um, but there is um, a, uh, some concern about people's ability with uh, IT. And I, I wonder whether you'd just like to mention that. Yeah, yeah. The, the Zoom system is actually very robust. And I, as I understand it, the whole thing is encrypted. So if you're in a private breakout room, you are in that room and there's absolutely no way that somebody is going to uh, come into that without you knowing. But, but I'm slightly concerned always about holding privileged uh, discussions in an uh, environment which I'm not in control of. And there is, particularly with IT, always the possibility that somebody slips up and lets, uh, lets, lets a connection uh, link somebody else to it or in some way somebody else taps into a connection that's been set up uh, <clears throat> incorrectly in the first place. So uh, although I, I think the breakout rooms could work really, really well, personally I feel more confident if I'm having uh, privileged discussions myself with my clients, professional and lay, I would probably want to do that within a forum that I'm controlling. And uh, whether that's done by way of a, s a separate Zoom conference, which you set up, which you could clearly do, uh, you could do it by way of a FaceTime link or whatever medium you want to be using as the as the lawyer. Um, I think giving some thoughts to 
how you manage that is probably well worth doing. And don't just assume that just because the breakout rooms are being offered to you, that's necessarily the way you want to do it. Uh, you may want to decide actually to, to keep control of the process yourself. I don't know, anecdotally, a few people in Chambers have already been holding hearings uh, remotely using Zoom, Sky for Business and, and other uh, similar forums. And they've been using WhatsApp as a separate group chat between themselves and their uh, clients to, to take instructions during the hearing. Or you can set that up in whatever other uh, mechanism you want to. So just, just be aware of the fact that because you're using an environment that um, is different to the norm, where you can look around in the courtroom and you see exactly who's there, or you can open the door to a conference room and see who's standing outside. Um, it's not always obvious within a digital platform exactly which screen is open to who at any particular time. And you, particularly if you're not so familiar with it, you could easily get yourself into a bit of a pickle. Yes, you don't want to be overheard saying, well, I, I advise you to settle at all costs. Exactly. Um, That's exactly the wrong time to be joining a, a general plenary session, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, we're really coming to the end now. And yeah. I, I know that we, we intend um, to come back in a week or so and talk about some, some of the legal issues which are arising in the financial remedy context. So um, I, I, don't, I, I don't propose um, that, uh, that we're going to dwell on those much at all now but I'm just interested because I've seen um, people asking this on Twitter it's a, it's a big question at the minute cases which have already gone on mm. um, is it is what is happening now a barter event and if it is and um, when did it become a barter event mm. well I mean that's a really interesting discussion that I think we we will need to deal with properly I mean we we the times that we're dealing with are unprecedented in many ways but they're as with so much in life, there's usually some precedent that's not entirely dissimilar that you can find somewhere in history. And only 11 or 12 years ago, we could, of course, had the financial crash, uh, where the courts were dealing with similar circumstances where people's businesses and livelihoods had been wrecked um, almost overnight. Um, and uh, as you'll know, in the Myerson case, where Mr. Myerson settled his case on the basis he was going to buy his wife out of a business and the business value then collapsed after the financial crash and he tried to go back and reopen on the basis that that was a barter event, he was given fairly short shrift on the basis of the case law in Cornick and um, uh, and the other cases for, since barter on the basis that a, a change in valuation is not something which is utterly unforeseeable. And therefore, uh, if you don't choose to share an asset on a wells and wells basis, you run the risk that if it collapses in value, you will be stuck with that. Now, whether what we're facing at the moment is of a different magnitude and therefore of a different category it's an interesting debate. I think we'll probably explore that next week or so once yeah. we have a little bit more clarity as to what's going on in the world and perhaps uh, are better informed to do that. Two points I'd like to briefly make, if I may. One is alongside BARDA, one uh, shouldn't overlook the, the barrel jurisdiction yep. um, and the capacity of a judge uh, to change their mind before the order is sealed. And... Um, uh, although it's generally referred to as the barrel jurisdiction. There was, of course, um, the case that went to the Supreme Court a few years ago um, where... Um, Real and B, yeah. Yes, where um, the Supreme Court considered whether or not a judge could simply change their minds after having uh, delivered a, um, a draft judgment. And there's no, um, there's no test of exceptionality. And that's something um, in those cases which uh, you settled... Um, 10 days ago, um, uh, but you yet to have the sealed order is something you might like to um, uh, think about. I know, um, uh, Andre, you are a, um, a, a supremely self-effacing individual who wouldn't dream of mentioning um, a certain book. Um, but So I'm going to do it on your behalf. Um, one of the best books I have in my library is Unlocking Matrimonial Assets on Divorce. Tragically, um, it stopped at the third edition. Um, and I know there's a lot of lawyers out there who really appreciate um, <clears throat> what you have to say in this book. But what um, is very useful within that book is chapter 27, which was written um, post the, um, the crisis um, uh, 10 years ago. Um, you, using financial remedy orders at times of economic uncertainty. So I'd suggest... Um, for those of you who have a, an old copy of this, um, you get it out and dust down um, chapter 27. And for those of you who don't have one, 
I'd get on to Amazon uh, Pronto and see whether or not you can uh, get your hands on one. I think it's available as an ebook, so that may be the easiest oh, way to get to it in these days of social, social isolation. Um, uh-huh. But thank you for that, very much for that, Rhys. Um, can I suggest maybe you and I pull up our armchairs around the fireplace again in a week or so, pour ourselves a dram of whiskey, and we discuss those issues? Excellent, yes. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Cheers. Cheers.